Hello boys and girls. Welcome to our religion class today. I welcome you and your parents as we today discuss about the vestments and the vessels and some things about the sanctuary. So let's now begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. St. Patrick, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, again, welcome. Today for our religion class, we're going to discuss things that are used for the Mass and talk a little about our own church here at St. Patrick's. I'm standing in the sanctuary, and the word sanctuary means holy place. As we stand in this sanctuary, I would like to point out a few things before we get ready for the class. When we come into church, we always genuflect and we wonder why. Well, we're genuflecting to the tabernacle. The tabernacle is the place where Jesus is. That bread that has become his body and blood that's left over mass is placed in the tabernacle. Now the word tabernacle means tent. It's a Hebrew word, a Jewish word, and it comes from our ancient tradition of faith. When Moses had given the, the Israelites the Ten Commandments, remember he had smashed them because he was angry at them because they were not obeying. Well, the Israelites picked up all the fragments of the commandments and placed them in this chest that was called the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was always with the Jewish people wherever they went. And in the evening, they would place the Ark in the tent, the tabernacle. The tabernacle back then was a tent that was silk with a cedar wood floor incense burned before it, and a lamp was there to signify the presence of, of the Lord. Well, in our faith, the Catholic faith, the Ark of the Covenant is the Eucharist, the bread and the wine that has become the body and the blood of Christ. When we have leftover Eucharist for Mass, we place it in the tabernacle. If we look towards the tabernacle, we can see that there is a silk veil in front of it, and over on my shoulder here, is the lamp that's called the sanctuary lamp and that burns to tell us that the presence of Christ is here. The lamp is red because it reminds us how the Lord shed his blood for us when he sacrificed himself on the cross. As I stand in the sanctuary, the holy place, we have the high altar and here I'm standing in front of the main altar. The main altar is the place of sacrifice where the bread and the wine will become the body and the blood of Christ. If you remember, whenever the priest begins the Mass, he kisses the altar. And he kisses the altar for two reasons. One, because it's the place of sacrifice where Christ becomes present. But also, in the altar are relics, relics of a saint who is a martyr. In our high altar, we have the relic of Saint Philip the Apostle was an apostle and a martyr. And so this is why the altar is referenced. As we gather now for our class, I'd like to begin by getting vested, getting dressed. So the first thing that the priest does when he's preparing to celebrate the mass is that he washes his hands. Now he washes his hands like you also wash your hands before you sit down for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, because you're sitting down to a meal. Remember, part of the action of the Mass is that it's a meal. You're coming to receive the body and the blood of Christ. And so the first thing the priest will do is wash his hands. And as he does, he says, give virtual law to my hands and every stain may be wiped away and I may be able to serve you without defilement of mind or body. And once the priest has washed his hands, he now gets ready to get vested for Mass. As you know, I don't come out dressed like this, I am wearing layers of clothes. Um, and so the first vestment that the priest places on him is called the amice. It's a large linen, reticulum shape with, um, with ties on it, which I'll explain in a few minutes. And the amice is a holdover from when the monks would say mass and they would use it as a covering over their hood. And it was used as protection. 
And so when the priest places the amos on, he says, place a lot on my head, the helmet of salvation, that I may overcome the assaults of the devil. Meaning he's praying that while he's offering the mass, that he will not be, um, he will not be a person that begins to begin to look around and that he's, he's focused in what he's saying and staying attentive to the prayers of the mass. And so he'll kiss the amos, place it over his head and he allows it to touch his head. And then it comes around his shoulders and neck and it gets put around his collar. Now I told you about the ties. Well, the ties, as it comes around, he places it around his waist and he ties it in place. The amos is also something that's used for practical reasons that it helps also to absorb perspiration when the priest is offering mass. As you can see, I'll be wearing a number of layers of clothes and the answer to your question is yes, it is very hot when you wear all these layers of clothes. The second vestment that goes on is called the alb. The alb is a long white robe that covers the priest from his shoulders down to the floor. Now, remember when Jesus rose from the dead, he was wearing a white robe. So the alb is a symbol of Christ's resurrection, a reminder that when the priest celebrates the sacraments, he becomes the altar Christus, another Christ. And if you remember some seeing pictures of your own baptism, when you were baptized, you were clothed, you were clothed in a white robe at that time. And as the priest places the alb on, he says the prayer, purify me, O Lord, from all stain and cleanse my heart, that washed in the blood of the Lamb, I may enjoy eternal delight. Then comes the rope, the cincture. This is a long rope that's like a belt that the priest wears around his waist. It is a reminder that the priest does not marry, that he forgoes having uh, a wife and children as a sacrifice um, for his people and for the church itself. Remember, a priest doesn't get married for three reasons. The first is that it is a sacrifice. The second is our Lord did not marry. And the third, it gives us enough time to, care, to take care of the people of the parish, to take care of people of the church. And so the sanctuary is worn in a special way. You have a loop, you bring one of the cords in, another cord through, and then you pull it tight around your waist. Now notice there's a lot of extra cord, and I'll explain that in a moment. As the priest places the cincture on, he says, gird me, O Lord, with the cincture of purity, and quench in my heart the fire of concupience, that the virtue of continence and chastity may remain in me. The next vestment that goes on is the stole. The stole is a symbol of the priest's authority. Whenever the priest celebrates a sacrament, he always wears a stole. When you might remember when we heard your confessions a few months ago, when you entered into the confessional and saw the priest, you saw that he was wearing a purple stole. Again, this is a symbol of our authority to celebrate the sacraments. So it's whether I'm baptizing, having a marriage, um, reconciliation, anointing of the sick, celebrating mass, a priest always wears a stole. And what he does first is he kisses the stole, places it around his neck, it hangs down. Now remember, I talked about the extra cord. Well, this comes in handy because now it keeps the stole in place. The final vestment to go on is the chasuble. This is a large covering of clothing. The word chasuble it comes from the Latin meaning little house. And it's more like a poncho when the priest puts it on. And it is to symbolize the yoke of Christ, the work and the burden of Christ. And as he does so, the priest says, O Lord, you said my yoke is sweet and my burden light, that I may carry it so to obtain your grace. And the final word to all these vesting prayers is amen. Amen is a word that means, yes, I believe, or so be it. Now, today I vested before you in white vestments. 
White vestments are worn for Christmas and Easter. It will be wearing white for your first communion, uh, the feast days of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and other saints. There are other colors that we wear that you've seen throughout your time, and so I'd like to just talk about a few of them. We have two different purples. This Ro Roman purple is worn during Lent, and it has more of a, a red tone to it, so it reminds us of the blood of Christ. The purple during Advent is more of a royal purple. It has a little bit more blue in it, and it speaks to us about expectation and waiting. Both Advent and Lent, we wear purple vestments because they are seasons of penance. Midway through Advent and midway through Lent, we wear the rose vestments. Now, the color rose is a reminder to us that the penitential seasons are almost over and it's a symbol of subdued joy that we're still waiting in expectation. On the third Sunday of Advent, Gaudote Sunday, we wear rose, and on the fourth Sunday of Lent, Latare Sunday, we wear rose as well. Throughout the year, you'll see us wearing green vestments. Green is worn during ordinary time. Now, ordinary time is twice in the, in the calendar year, following Christmas until Lent begins and following from Pentecost until Advent begins. The color green reminds us of hope. And throughout that season, we're always awaiting our hope is the return of Christ. The final color that you will see is red. Red is worn on, Holy, on Good Friday and also on Palm Sunday. It's a symbol of blood. It reminds us of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Red is also worn on the feast day of martyrs. Now remember, I talked about the relics of martyrs in the altar. A martyr is a saint who gave witness to his faith by the shedding of his blood. And so the red vestments remind us of that shedding of blood. And red is also worn on the Feast of Pentecost, usually a brighter red, and that symbolizes the Holy Spirit coming upon the church. So these are our vestments that we wear. And now I'd like to talk to you about the vessels and how they're prepared for Mass. We'll begin with the chalice. The chalice is the cup that will hold the wine that becomes the blood of Christ. Now the chalice I'm holding before you today is my ordination chalice. When I was ordained 33 years ago, my parents had this chalice made for me. This chalice actually was made over in Holland and it was given to me at the time of my ordination by my parents and family members. So this is the chalice. Now, we then add a linen called a purificator. The purificator is like the napkin that you have at your place at the dinner table. It's used to help to clean. Well, the purificator is used to purify or to cleanse the chalice um, at the end of mass. Then we have the plate or the paten. The paten is the vessel that the um, host will go on, that bread that becomes the body of Christ. Now, the priest has his own host on his paten. It's a little bit larger than yours, only so people can see it easier. After the chalice is prepared, we take a, a plexiglass actually covered in linen, and this is called the pall. The pall is placed on top and is used for protection. In the ancient church, when the mass was celebrated in the catacombs and in the caves, because it was illegal for the Christians to worship, they would be in these caves and catacombs and because dirt might fall from the ceiling, the priest would place a piece, a piece of slate over the chalice to protect it to make sure that dirt doesn't fall in. Today we use the pall a lot of times just to keep the flies out if they're buzzing around uh, during the warmer season. After the chalice is prepared, <coughs> we cover the chalice in a veil, and it's a <coughs> uh, the color of the veil usually matches the color of the vestments, and this we're using white today. The reason why we veil the chalice is we're reminding ourselves <coughs> that this is a vessel that's going to hold the Eucharist. 
the body and the blood of Christ. On top of the veil chalice, we have another linen that's called a corporal. The word corporal means body holder. And the corporal is placed on the altar and it's unfolded. And it's unfolded in a special way. Um, and so in case any crumbs of the host may fall out, we can fold them up and they would stay inside. And the chalice and the paten are placed on top of the corporal during mass. We also now, another vestment, another vessel is the ciborium. This is the vessel that holds the host that become the, the body of Christ. Those small round bread um, that you see your parents receiving on Sunday. Now you can tell the difference between a ciborium and a chalice in that the ciborium always has a lid or a cover on it. Other things that you might see along the way are these two glass jugs that we call cruets. The cruets hold the wine and the water that are used throughout the mass. The wine is placed in the chalice with a little bit of water. And then as the priest washes his hands uh, before the offertory, he uses the water, the bowl, and the towel. To help the priest <clears throat> during mass, there's a book on the altar that's called the Missal. The Missal has all the prayers that the priest needs for mass, and you can tell by the strings that are set, he knows which pages to turn to as he's offering the mass. If I go over here <coughs> towards our ambo, or our pulpit, here is where the book of readings is kept, the readings from scripture. This book is called a lectionary, and the lectionary has all the readings throughout the year in it from the scriptures broken up according to the times and the seasons. And again, it is used for the mass. You'll sometimes see <coughs> a lay person do the first or the second reading, and a deacon or a priest will read the gospel. Well, boys and girls, I hope that we've had a chance today to explain some of these things to you, some of the things that you see. We'll be having other videos for you as you can continue to, pray, to prepare for your first Holy Communion. I know that this has become a very difficult time for all of us in many different ways, but I do promise you, you will have your first communion and we will have a chance to celebrate that great day together. But until then, we're going to have our classes this way, either through your teachers or through myself or maybe some of the other priests to help assist you to prepare for that special day when you receive the body and blood of Jesus for the first time in your life. Know that we continue to pray for you and we hope that you continue to pray for us. Thank you and have a good day.